platform 82. Um, it's a new space. It was a former gallery space. Now we moved to Schlüterstrasse, but here we're trying to do something different. Um, we're trying to create a space for conversations, for um, other kinds of programs, and for um, yeah, meetings, and to have uh, nice talks with wonderful guests. Um, so, uh, first, very briefly, I want to introduce also myself. Uh, my name is Marjolein van der Meer. Uh, I work here together with Stephanie Haasley, um, who is our Director of Institutional Relations. <coughs> and in this uh, video screening program, we um, want to connect artists uh, that have a certain shared identity, let's say, uh, in which they, they uh, can combine uh, their poetic poetic visual explorations on memory, uh, history, and the shaping of identity. <coughs> and uh, tonight as our guest, uh, first you see uh, Guido Casaletto, who is our artist um, from Istanbul, and Marianne van der Slaag, uh, who is a curator at the Oude Kerk in Amsterdam, the Oude Kerk uh, Old Church in Amsterdam. Um, first, I want to tell you a little bit about Guido. Um, his recent exhibitions include uh, ones at um, the Fondation de Merz and uh, at Mo Mochak, the Museum of Contemporary Art in Krakow. And uh, tomorrow he will also be opening a show at the Italian Cultural Institute here in Berlin. And in his works, Guido Casaretto conveys the connection of humans to culture and geography. Uh, he does that through his own personal history, through myths, through science and technology. Uh, the narrative he adopts does not follow any temporal and spatial uh, linearity. He focuses on the phenomenon of sensation. Uh, he's engaged with various materials and art historical references and his work overlaps the different sensations with regards to the physical quality of the material and the types of perception within the concept of art history. Um, I think I won't go too much into the video. I think I will leave that up to you guys. Um, I just want to also uh, introduce Marianne van der Zwaag. So, uh, as said, a curator of uh, the Old Church in Amsterdam. She studied art history at the University of Amsterdam and curates contemporary art in Amsterdam's oldest building. Uh, the Oude Kerk invites artists to create new works exclusively for this location. Uh, and the program connects past, present, and future through the interplay of ancient heritage and contemporary art. Right now, there's an exhibition just opened by Meredith Monk, and uh, previous programs include Suzanne Phillips, Antonio Oba, and Ibrahim Mahama. Also behind you, you can see a video of Isel Stad. We had last week a conversation uh, with Isel Stad and Fuzun Turetken. Um, in which uh, she investigates the story of Ada Kale, which is a missing island submerged underwater. Um, so you can find more information or more background on Isis' work uh, there on that table. And there's also a small ceramic work related to the video. Uh, and if you have any other questions about it, you may, of course, ask. Um, so I will give you to the microphone. Thank you. First of all, thank you for inviting me. Nasli, Marjolein, thank you very much. Nice to meet such an interesting artist. Um, one question, are we going to first uh, uh, see the video or do we have it in the background and just start a conversation? What do you think? I think we can start with the conversation because the video is uh, all it's very similar, it doesn't yeah. have a start or a finish. Yeah. And, uh, so I don't think, if you prefer, we can... No, let's do, it. let's do. Then um, we keep it like this and then I wanted to start because my line already introduced to me and I thought what is good to start with is to have you um, tell a bit more about the ritual uh, the pagan ritual that is um, that you used for the video, yes. and uh, how do you understand this ritual? Because I uh, understand that there are several possible uh, yes. interpretations of it. Yes. So maybe it's good to hear yours. Well, 
Uh, okay, the ritual is the, as it is now, is uh, the ritual of the uh, Mount which is uh, a, a type of carnival ritual that they, uh, they do in the north of Sardinia in Italy. But uh, actually the origins of this ritual are uh, much older, pre-Christian. So it's more than a question of interpretation. The narrative has changed, keeping the same uh, structure. So uh, it was ac actually it's the if we start with the uh, with the pagan ritual is actually the sacrifice of a human, which is it's not a uh, recreation. It's an actual sacrifice. So they start with, uh, with crossing the sea and abducting, uh, crossing to the Ligurian side of Italy, abduct uh, a person from, we don't know actually what type of tribe they had, but we have some information. These are pre-Roman period also. And uh, they abduct uh, someone from that tribe, bring him back and sacrifice him. This is in the stand uh, one once a year. <laughs> so they <coughs> when uh, when the Christianity and Roman uh, mythology came about, uh, the narratives change, but the figures. So this is the sacrificial. Uh, this one, and um, uh, it transformed into a carnival sacrifice, mm -hmm. very macro, again, it's not uh, a happy uh, instance, and uh, they continue recreating this ritual, but using animal parts more than fish. So this is a mismatch between the, that and uh, the pagan. Itself. So it's not an interpretation of the mind, it's everything back in a pot and this what comes out. Yeah, yeah. Because I wanted to do it like that, I wanted to first focus a bit on the work and unpacking it and ask mm -hmm. questions and then uh, maybe talk a bit more about the common ground that we have. Uh, working with history. So that is something I thought it would be interesting for this uh, upcoming hour to talk about. And of course, feel free to ask questions also if you have them. We can do it at the end, but also if you have them in between, do feel free to uh, interrupt and ask. Um, because um, what immediately struck me is, is that it's such a poetic video and that you don't have a clue where you are and are you looking at an image of the future or an image of the past you don't have an idea and um, also you are aware of the fact that it's on earth because also you see the shadows so you are aware that there is a sun um, but it this doesn't give you much it's really stripped um, and also this man walking over there, almost blending in the landscape, because they also, the structure that uh, is around them, so it, it blends in. So there are a lot of things that you think, hmm, where am I looking at? It's really a fragment uh, uh, that is constructed. Um, and I was fascinated about, because in the video you choose a very specific part of the story, I think. Why yes. that specific part? Well, the, the crossing uh, of that narrow sea uh, coming back with the figure <coughs> is actually the only thing that is repeated in all the uh, repetitions of the narrative during the changes that we have in this, uh, historical changes that we have in this ritual. So, um, the abduction part gets lost with Christianity because there is not, they cannot use it in their own narrative. That's why the only thing that stays is the uh, 
br bringing an, a living thing from one location to the other to be sacrificed. So I chose to repeat that. And uh, of course I, I used the salt lake for the crossing to represent uh, the crossing of the narrow uh, sea. But also um, I chose this location because I wanted, because Sardinia is again it's uh, in the middle of uh, between Ita Italy and France and it's mm. well, culturally also it's, mm. it's very mixed uh, in that sense and Gokuchiada uh, which is the island <coughs> where I took uh, where, where we shot the video is uh, again in the middle between Greece and Turkey so everything even the uh, longitude takes in that so the, the, it's very it's much smaller but it's very similar in geography in uh, maybe attitude also uh, cultural so that's why I chose this location and also uh, because it's on the border as an island uh, there are military bases, so because there are a lot of military bases, there is there is less man-made construction yeah. around it. So it's it's uh, it's a pain to get um, permits to shoot, but if you shoot, <laughs> if you get them, the, uh, it's easier to to have only the landscape around you. Why your fascination for this was ritual? Uh, because um, I, uh, it's biographical. I am just my family moved from there, from the abducted part, mm -hmm. not Sardinia, mm -hmm. Liguria, to East, to Istanbul, like uh, 400 years ago. So I always try to find things that I know nothing about, but that seem very geographical to me. We don't talk about these things because they are lost, of course, but uh, we have connection to these rituals. We also, of course, continue during the carnival and so on, but not this. So I try to find inputs and uh, there are, there should be mine, but they are not at all. Take points from there. Mm -hmm. That's why it's ritual. Do you more often use rituals in your day? No, I use processes in your day. But the, the repetition of, uh, of the process of another artist or another artisan or industrial thing. Mm -hmm. Is uh, it's very similar to this. So I take the, the the process that they use and repeat it until it loses a little bit of its uh, purpose. Let's say this also loses its purpose as a carnival. Yeah. yeah. Um, Oh yeah, you said you mentioned a specific place in the setting because you could see it as a mixture of land art and performance art yeah. uh, in a way. Mm -hmm. um, could you elaborate a bit more uh, on that? Do you want to connect to the physical? I mean, where the body actually comes in and mm -hmm. you have to navigate them. Yes, in, uh, all of my pieces have, a, because of this repetition, have a physical presence that I normally uh, experience myself. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, in this work, it's uh, I'm very used to be hands-on on my pieces I, uh, because I do the process itself also. Here I am one of the elements, so uh, I I chose not to. Uh, be present 
do the editing or anything about the filming because I, it's a medium that I'm not very uh, comfortable with. Mm -hmm. But the narrative needed this medium, so uh, I saw the, the movie after it was finished. Yeah, because that was, um, I was wondering, because film is not that material, and you yes. also more work with material, with objects. Yes. So how does this film relate to the other works you made? It relates only in the, in the process of the performance. Because all, everything here uh, is, uh, I again recreated the masks and everything from pieces of of my older pieces. So uh, the process that I did as a performance is it's very similar to the other pieces, but uh, the video itself is um, it only represents the, the timeline of the production, let's say. Yeah. Yeah. You already mentioned that indeed a common ground is this repetition. Yes. And that is in your work. Um, you elaborated a bit more on that already. And I also think that um, I read somewhere that you draw a parallel between uh, the uh, methodology you use and the computer algorithm. Yes. The... So both working with this set of defined to, to yes, I use, uh, sometimes I use algorithms, uh, computer algorithms to, actually I don't use the algorithms, I, I copy the algorithms while, while they are doing their job, I try to repeat mm -hmm. the same process by uh, physical means. That's why it's similar in that way, because um, I, I try to take out uh, the, the process that I, I'm copying and recreate the same thing, meaning to do the same outcome. But because of that, um, let's say, uh, repetition, it starts to lose the, uh, the actual meaning. That's why algorithms work very good in that, because it's, it's only a machine that gives an output, whatever input mm -hmm. So I try to do that, actually. This is also uh, very representative of that. What ritual is of great importance for you? An own ritual, for example. I'm not sure because I don't. I, I have no, <laughs> no belief system. Actually, that's why I'm not very. Yeah. To ask after, just. Yeah, of course. There's right. also love rituals. You said uh, that you don't really. Uh, do a lot of artworks on the rituals, but I remember that there was more like benches, like church benches that are yes. like really dusted. Mm -hmm. What is it for you about if not about the ritual and also like kind of forgetting about the ritual? Yeah, actually, that that piece, it's um, I the process was I. I found a church bench that was discarded from the church and I asked them to, to take it. I took that and uh, took a mold and then I uh, shredded again the, the, the bench itself and recast it until I finished the material. So actually that was um, the recreation of a uh, I wanted to see how much uh, I could recreate of the same piece until it lost its function. It also feels like a ritual to me. Every, <laughs> every artistic practice feels a ritual. Yes, but 
they are not my rituals. I just repeat the rituals that they use. So, of course, every process, everything uh, that, that you find is, seems a ritual. Also, if you, even if you take an, a very uh, industrial uh, process, let's say, if you put it in the, in the art production <coughs> system, it becomes a ritual because it has that ritualistic uh, end to it. But uh, it's not something that I repeat myself outside of my artistic practice. I'm just looking if there are more in between questions because that's possible also. Yeah. <laughs> a repetition is indeed uh, something that fascinates me, but also this positioning yourself in the middle, yeah? just in, in between times, in between uh, processes. So mm -hmm. that's what you also. So I was wondering, ah, the process is so important uh, in the work already. Um, how how do you see this end this this end point of of your work? Um, could could you also uh, could you also use it again? Could it be a moment in time and to use it again? Yes, I do. I have a lot of pieces mm -hmm. that go on like this. I have a lot of pieces that uh, are actually linked to my. Um, until I reach the ability to do that. Mm -hmm. So it's, I start with, uh, with the physical process that I'm not keen on, that I know nothing about. And then repeating that, but I show all the repetitions uh, back to back until I come to a certain point that is similar to what those artisans did, and then I leave it there and I start with something else. Yeah. So yeah. everything depends on uh, the process itself, the starting point. So they had to achieve a certain point in uh, skill, so I have to achieve that. Or um, the algorithms that say that you were re referring to, if I am copying a sculptural uh, program, they tend to work like very hyper realistically. So I have to learn to do that physically. Yeah. And when I I reach that point, I have sufficient to think that I must not do it. That's how I continue. <laughs> I was thinking about moving a bit to stories because that's also something that's very much uh, the material, the stories of the material, the stories of the, um, uh, for example, this the ritual. Looking at people, people live in stories. Uh, I always think how they come together to retell them, to share them, to pass them on, and to return to them, to look for comfort uh, and escape and create along the way their own stories. Um, when I bring up this story, this scene, I, I already mm -hmm. asked it a bit, but, but still, it's because it's this, um, why show it in this moment in time, bring it up now? Why, why did you find it interesting now to use this as material to, to, and to pick this scene? Uh, well, uh this was, uh, I think, 2017, if I remember correctly. So this fun for me, functions, functions in a, as an archetype for um, let's say uh, cultural movements between uh, borders but it functions better as a forced 
culture, culture and, you know, because uh, without the uh, sacrificial lamp, this uh, the others don't don't have a function. But it's like um, forcing um, I wouldn't take it to colonialism or something like that, but it's very similar to that because we were talking about this uh, in that period during the uh, this everything was before COVID, but there was a, a, a big wave of migration, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, Turkey was living this uh, after the Syrian war. And, so on. So this was. This has all the elements without having any of those elements. That's why it was relevant for me during that time period to produce that. And it worked with the Mojek exhibition also because uh, that that also had a lot of geographical and cultural elements that I was trying to show how it would. It would be possible to transport those informations from one place to the other. Yeah. A, little, a little bit musically, probably, but uh, this also is part of that. That's why the reason. Uh, I wanted to go and talk a bit more about the history, but I think before going to that part and to see more where uh, we common ground, maybe, yeah. the history. Um, are there any questions about the video now, or any questions that came up so far? And maybe it would be interesting, uh, or I mean, I would like to hear a little bit more about the masks and the costumes um, that you made for this, or how are they they're related to the ritual, I assume? Well, yeah, they are... Uh, close recreations of uh, the masks that they use actually for this ritual. The, the specific one is the second one, mm. uh, which is not used in other parts of Italy. But uh, the, if you notice, it's the only human between them. The one that is <coughs> sacrificed is the only human. And uh, the others are actually, the original masks are ma original heads of animals that they uh, use. And uh, I, all, I didn't use that, I recreated the masks. But they use, uh, the one that I am wearing and the third one is the pelvis of a, of a bear. So, they have symbols within them, and uh, that's why it's called the stranger, that, that the third figure, because it's uh, it's not part of the herd, you know, the bear is something that comes from outside and eats your uh, animal. So, uh, and we you know... And the third person, right? You are the actor. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. The others are also artists, uh, friends of mine. Then nobody would do this because it's very, it's very hard. Uh, we didn't know that it would hurt so much, but it's really, really hurts. Uh, especially the center of the lake, it's, it's like a mere meter um, or 50 centimeters uh, deep, but you always cut when you step up on it. You cut and the salt cures it, and you cut again with every step. So it's uh, and you you have to walk because you have to finish the, that line. So it's uh, yeah. This part is yes, it's the painful part. <laughs> <laughs> if you see a black line behind it, yes, it's painful. But in a way, it's also very much about this suffering or something like yes. I have a feeling this scapegoat and this like yes. and death and all these um, yes. these this part of the ritual, uh, yeah, it kind of reflects in the landscape. 
But yes, also things that you're not experiencing right now, but the smell also. It's mm -hmm. because every time you step on that, you know, salt is very curing. You, do, you don't feel anything. But when you step on it, all the organic material starts to move. And there is a lot of wind and you cannot hear each other. So it's, uh, it was very interesting. As an experience, yes. Why did you choose the silence? Sorry? Why did you choose the silence? Uh, because uh, I, I didn't think that the wind, you, you could only have wind here. I didn't want to add anything else. Uh, I didn't think that it worked very good with the, because it's not a question of. Uh, Because the wind is very dynamic there, mm -hmm. it's, it clashes with the silence and uh, with the um, slow pace of the video. We had recordings, but they also chose because, it, as I said, at a point I said I'm, I, did, I don't want to uh, no, be involved, so also they chose the, uh, not to use it. Can I ask something? Yeah. Is it also to uh, create a, a big contrast with the, the carnaval as we know yes. it? Yes. Because I, I grew up in the south of the Netherlands, next to the German border, yeah. and also in Germany, uh, I know that they celebrate carnaval. Yeah. But it's it's full of people, a lot of noise. It's mm -hmm. it's a big contrast with your. Yes, it's very, it's, it's a very fun event, let's say. It's a, it's a celebration, the carnival, normally. It, everywhere is like this. But in Sardinia, it's not. It's a little bit it's similar to this. Uh, but it's, and it's also much bloodier, because they use real animal parts. So it's quite uh, disturbing. So, but it's it's different. But the, you can feel again uh, there there are some dynamic figures that come after these to bring the funny part of the carnival. Let's say. Mm -hmm. But yes, for me, it's, this part is very. Uh, it was very important to recreate this. So it's it's a contrast, of course. The sound, the lack of sound, also is, it gives that. But I liked also to see that they had the uh, you know the bells or not because yeah. Yeah. and I preferred not to because we could hear the bells also uh, a lot. But it's I think uh, it works without sound much better. It is suggested to sound is also yes, it's present. Yeah. 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 You wanted to ask the question. I wanted to ask once again, um, the bear was not in the original original, right? The bear not in the original. It was in the, in the pagan original. It was? Yes. We think, because we don't have written recordings, we only have the... Um, Either uh, <coughs> stories that they are uh, they are passed on, or we have a few drawings and things like that uh, on that, on for it and things like that. But uh, we think that that is that was uh, because a bear is not a very common animal in Italy. It's, uh, it should it had to represent that. It's just really interesting that there are four figures mm -hmm. and he decided to be the third, the bear that is the outsider. Yeah. But it's also like the story is, as you said, it's personal to you because it's all the ritual that yeah. happened once and your family was from the opposite yeah. side, but you're still the outsider. I think it's an interesting mm -hmm. contrast. Yeah, I chose to be the outsider uh, purposely because also 
I grew up and I lived in, in a, as a minority in a, uh, in a country that is not then I'm not completely a part of. That's why it's uh, it's, it's, it's a standard for me that's, to be an outsider. So I I chose a purpose purpose to that. Yeah. Um, logistical questions and practical questions. How how long was the walk? How many meters of kilometers? How uh, long did it take? Well, we we did that for a day, but we we didn't walk a straight line for a day. We we walked around the, uh, the whole day because it's not huge. You could walk it in like uh, 20, 25 minutes, but we did. Sometimes you can see from the drone footage where we walked before. You can see two black lines, so it was us. The other line also. <laughs> you can see here. This is 10 minutes. 10 minutes here. <laughs> yeah, but it's, uh, it's a, a never-ending torture. <laughs>
Shall we go for it to be a, uh, maybe a bit to images? To Different kind of images? Yeah, yeah. Um, but then I need yeah. to have yeah. the link. So what maybe is good to share, what I wanted to do is share a bit more uh, about the space where I work. So I brought some images of installations that were there. And I thought it would be interesting to share that and to then see what kind of conversations come up, comes up from there. So what we are looking at, so I'm curator at the Outer um, a building um, started in the Middle Ages, the early Middle Ages, um, 1306, uh, then it started its life, it was there already a bit before as a small wooden construction and then it became this wood, this, this stone building that grew um, organically uh, along with the city that grew around it. So um, it's not so much one fixed moment in time but it slowly developed and that's what you also sense when you are there. And 10 years ago, after a long period of restoration in this oldest building of Amsterdam, it became at the same time a place of contemporary art. So twice a year, we commission artists to work with this building. Now there's a loop going on, but I will tell when the, uh, an image uh, pops up. This is uh, an image of an installation by an Italian artist, Giorgio Andriotto Calò, and he uh, worked with the, um, the color of red and the, the meaning in the Catholic uh, uh, tradition. And we um, put voil, uh, or uh, foley, voil, for all the windows, covered them with red voil. So uh, one summer long, for five months, the whole church was bathing in red light. Uh, and then you have to know also that the church is in the middle of the red light district in Amsterdam, so the very historic part of the, the city. So um, it was. Uh, one gesture, but that was happening a lot uh, in the church space, and there was a lot of um, response also. A lot of people who very much liked it, but there was also a lot of people who disliked it, and there was a lot of discussion about the work. It even led to a lawsuit, which eventually uh, we won, but there was a lot of discussion. It's, it's a very sensitive place in the city, and a lot of people are very involved and feel very involved with the uh, place. So working the church is still active. So it's an right. active church community also. So every Sunday, a small community of people, church community, gather here, about 50 people. So that's always the case. They come together in this, in the installation that is then there. So they also gathered here mm -hmm. a whole summer long, every Sunday in this red uh, night and they had their uh, rituals over here. Um, and this was the instrument of troubled dreams. Carnival and Miller, they made this mellotron, they positioned that in the high choirs, so, and um, there were speakers uh, all over uh, the church, and it was very nice. They recorded sounds from the city, sounds from inside of the building, and they um, people were invited to play the mellotron, so very much to also be part of the artwork that was there. So that is, of course, the church is one big acoustic chamber, so that worked very well also. This is a more recent work of Ibrahim Mahama, he's um, coming from Ghana, um, works, was fascinated by that the floor is covered by 2,000 gravestones and a lot of people are buried underneath. So underneath the floor of the outer kerk were buried almost 60,000 people uh, from the founding fathers of Amsterdam and a lot of people after uh, uh, that. And it very much also connected uh, to his origin Ghana, where in the coast of the west coast there were these coastals and forts that played an important role first in the trade um, and later on in the colonial history. So he made these connections between these two places. Um, 
And so he worked with almost flipping the floor up and working with material and soil that came from Ghana and he made these sort of new sculptures uh, that covered the floor. And they were spread all over the floor and beds hanging on the ceiling. Um, so that was uh, more recent. This is uh, Antonio Oba, a Brazilian artist who worked with the, the rituals, also referring to this diaspora and colonial history. Um, so that was also uh, recent, and because we then made the choice of inviting artists from a non-European context to relate to the, uh, the building and the site. And this is uh, the Children of the Light. Uh, this was then together with a series of concerts we did, because there, the, like many churches, it houses an organ. And the organ is this huge instrument that plays an important role. Uh, also, you see it in every uh, European church. And um, the bigger the, the organ starting as a small organ, but getting bigger and bigger because there was a competition between churches also to have the most biggest organ. Because there's this famous saying, who has the uh, sound has the power. That's all that's very much related to the organ. And then we, this whole summer, we made this series of concerts working with the organ and putting in <coughs> electronic music and other devices. So that, well, that's briefly, this is Marina's bosom. Um, and in between you see, of course, also this huge space that the Audekerk is, 3,000 square meters in the city center. Um, that is very inviting to artists to work with and uh, to uh, relate to uh, that. And what I try to do always is to focus very much on what an artist is interested in when entering. So not trying to tell as much as possible about what you know, but trying to keep it open and, and start with what is a fascination. And, um, before I came, there is all also group shows, but uh, they stopped doing that because it works better to have one artist in that space that where already so much is happening and so many voices are there to, to do one by one. So that's how, where we are now. And then you also invite them for months, right, to, mm -hmm. to stay with mm -hmm. you and to... Yeah. yeah, to work for a long <coughs> period of time because it's not an easy place and you, so you really have to get to know it and um, for us, the process is also very important to have um, them visit again and again because you see more and more, you have to dig deeper because otherwise uh, you have, to, yeah, you have to, to interact with the building and not position something in that you already have. You have to start anew when you are there. At least that is what I experienced as working with artists. It's very important to to be able to start when you are there and not bringing something that already exists because then it stays um, isolated. So interaction uh, uh, really makes that it becomes a new experience. This is Susan Phillips, a Berlin-based artist also, who had this enormous silence in which her untrained voice could be heard. And when you walk towards one of the silos, you heard only her voice as one voice. But when you uh, were positioned, for example, in the middle of the church, you all heard this whole choir because she then you heard them all at the same time. And she was working with um, Sveling, who was a, a famous organist that played the organ for a long period of time. And uh, he's, he's as famous as Bach is in Germany. We have Sweden. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that's briefly about it. Um, this place that is very special, and I think it is very nice this invitation and also seeing that how how you could work with history. That is almost also what I see around me now uh, a lot, and also almost an artist like an archivist. Uh, to use that and to dig deeper and to do it 
in a different way, with different methods and different categorizations than we are used to, just like you use this old pagan story and you, you, you fix on a certain element or, or, or from that and bring something new by stripping it, by doing something different, by putting, yeah, transforming it to a, a video. And this transformation, I think, is very much at the core of what time is about, because it's never fixed, but it's always transforming. Just like this church, maybe it, it looks like it's, it's very stable, but it never was stable. It was always in motion and moving and changing and from a Catholic into a Protestant church and adapting all the rituals that were there. So it's always about that. And I think that is what I very much sense also in your work. This is very similar in that sense. Uh, also the question of appropriation yeah. is very... It's a concept that we are starting to understand as a society very much and I'm, it's something that I'm very interested in. That's why this, this type of uh, interaction is interesting to me in the video and also in pieces like this. Yeah, and I, it's more maybe a, a sort of um, what I is a sense. I mean, I always have to, of course, this history of the white cube, and then this is already one step outside of that into um, real life and, and places where there is already this history and where people gather for so long, and there's also this violent history, everything that is there. So for artists to create in life and be part of that and all the stories that are there and to relate to that. I think that is also super interesting uh, to deal with that. And how how is that for you? Because you, of course, also show your works in an exhibition space. Yes. The film was created outside, but the film, the video is shown into an exhibition place. How do you think um, did you ever do performances outside? Well, I had the chance a few times to work in situ mm. in spaces that are not galleries. But they were actually out in outdoor spaces, not up, uh, architectural uh, pieces, but mainly uh, uh, a type of, let's say, land especially in the south of Turkey. That's why, uh, yes, I know that uh, the process is very similar, but uh, I didn't have any chance to work with a special uh, architectural space, let's say. That's why I'm not sure how it would work with, uh, with that type of uh, production. Just looking around if questions come up also. <laughs> yeah, there's a question about what you mentioned earlier about this red light. Uh, so when did people see problem? Uh, because you said there was even a lawsuit or something? Yeah, because, well, it was... Um, uh, people found it very overwhelming, this whole mm -hmm. red church. and. Uh, looking green when they came out. <laughs> uh, and then, uh, especially in the church community themselves, they, they had this, their meetings inside the world and it, it was too much for them. Mm -hmm. um, because it was not on the side, it was, not, it was, it was very much there. And, they, um, and then there was uh, the idea of uh, having one window for a longer period of time. And then there was this whole idea of, oh no, this is never going to change and it's going to stay. And it was not the case, but then that, was, that information was already lost. Mm -hmm. So uh, there was so much resistance already. Um, so then things got out of hand a bit. And then I sensed, oh yeah, it's so important in a place like this, where there's so many people involved, how to 
how to keep the conversation going. Although there is fight and there is disagreement, how to, how to add uh, art words temporarily, but also be able to, although you don't like it that much or disagree, how, how, to, how to be and keep the conversation going. Uh, so that's why now we, every year, on the longest day of the year, we have the so-called red window conversation. And then uh, we invite people and to meet again mm -hmm. and to see how things are going. Uh, things are going. Mm -hmm. And last time we invited uh, 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 people from the Red Light Heritage uh, community, uh, from the Red Windows. So we try to vary a bit in topics, but it's all about how to keep the conversation going. I think that is important working in a place like this. It's also interesting how that has to do with history, like the history of the place, the history of the surroundings. Uh, recent, I mean, this is a very recent part of history, but actually also very old of this part of the city. And uh, yeah, all these elements I think come together in this building. Um, yeah. Which yeah. I, yeah, which I guess is a similar way as Vito <coughs> also does in his videos, where or in this video especially where. Um, there's the awareness of this pagan ritual it's somewhere in your family or in your um, consciousness some, somehow and it's um, yeah. But I have the same distance to that ritual as a Christian ritual that's why yeah we have the I think we all have the, these elements in our in our uh, understanding, probably the archetypes we have, uh, at least. But I was curious to know: is the church still still uh, mm -hmm. active in, in the sense of the artistic portfolio here? So they are aware of the pieces that they are. Because in Italy you couldn't <laughs> do anything with this, uh, like a red church or anything like that. Oh yeah, but the church it is uh, because it was long owned by the church community, but then it was uh, oh, there were leakages and it was it was in a poor condition. So in 1955 they sold it for this symbolic amount, and then a foundation was founded to restore the building, and this foundation that is. Uh, uh, that now has the program and a user is the church community so it's okay. it, it's not that we have to um, uh, ask is it allowed but it's the other way around uh, but of course you still have to uh, live together in a peaceful way so uh, uh, that's where the conversation comes in um, well, but that works quite uh, well now. And I think what is also super important here is that there is, and that is also related, I think, to how you work, there's a lot of immaterial that is here. So you sense really the spirit of the place. Uh, it's not all about the stones, it's not only about the stones, there's so much that you don't see, but that you are very much aware of that it is there. Um, and maybe even more. So the, the empty places and the emptiness that come, becomes very prominent when you are there. And that is uh, scale also perfect is material to work with. Sca huh? Scale is also something that we are not very used to. The scale of the space is very huge. So yeah. it's very... Yeah. yeah. And it has this specific construction because it's... Uh, the, um, uh, um, it's it had to be a very light construction because the, of the funding and the, the, the floor underneath. So it is this construction of a turnaround uh, upside down ship. And the, the, so the ceiling is a wooden ceiling. Mm -hmm. It's a turnaround ship. And thinking of the archive, do some of the works remain? That's interesting because when I, when I started, I started also working on Ah, but these artworks, they are only here temporarily, for a couple of months. But how to give them a longer life? Because it's, of course, it's still now in the memory of people. 
the whole red church, for example. So how to add to the uh, to the place and how to deal with that? So I started to create this archive uh, in which we try to document the artistic processes that take place here. Uh, so including also the conversation with the artist, the conversation, so the moment of the installation, all the documentation of the installation, but also the interactions of the audiences. So that is what I try to do now, and I, uh, I hope that that will be online soon. But I think that is also very nice, and that deals also with this immaterial part, because that's still continuing, of course. Yeah. Uh, so you were mentioning that like, this just sentence just brought me back to Guido's work. Uh, all those artworks are in, in the memories of, of the weavers. So, Guido, in your practice, not just in this video, but in your, not just, maybe we can just go back to the video. Uh, yeah. Yeah. In, in the video and also in your other works, um, do you have the purpose of capturing the memory of the material or of that object itself? I'm talking about the benches or I'm talking about the ritual itself. Do you have the purpose of capturing that that memory of the of your of that subject matter in your works as well not just mm -hmm. material and the process but the memory of I and tend, history of it. I tend to think that uh, on the physical object uh, the presence of the physical objects it, uh, have have already embedded because of the process of that it's embedded in it. So it's not a, an actual uh, outside memory, but it's embedded in the process. That's why I, I don't think in sense of a memory, but of a, uh, of a repetition of the same thing. That's why it, it's already embedded in it. So I don't choose uh, anything according to what it can uh, reminiscence, let's say, and choose according to the process. Hmm. Okay, thank you. So, and the process already has? Yes. Whatever yes, it's, it's given, it. it's given, okay. right, so. Thank you. I also have to think of, um, in relation to your work, is what Ibrahim Ahama mentioned. He's the artist with the gravestones mm -hmm. and this uh, material that is so important mm -hmm. to him also. He mentioned that to him the material is a teleportation in time also. Yes. Because of the material and that. And, uh, and yeah, it's similar. Yeah, that's similar indeed and that you try to, by way, by, by this repetition, mm -hmm. uh, that you even go a step further in that. Yeah, but I tend to think like think of it like as a, a ready-made. My works are ready-made, but they are uh, ready-made movements, not ready-made material. I do the same thing again. Oh, I also have to think of this this um, uh, line that I heard: unintentional artworks, and that's also something because maybe the artwork yeah. is already in the process. Huh? Yes, of course. Very much so. Yeah. There's a respect to the materials itself. This um, is how I see it. You respect the boundaries of of the yeah. ritual. You respect the boundaries of the material itself. Well, I'm, I'm not sure about that because, <laughs> because you just like it, <laughs> yeah, and also because it's, we produce constraining things. You know, it doesn't want to do that. You push that. To be like this, mm. uh, so this is not a tree. Mm. This is a table because we constrain it to be a table. Mm. So I'm not sure about uh, what we are actually respecting. So how much we are respecting it? But of course, I by repeating that process, I'm not sure. Uh, how much I go back to the material, but I surely try to go back to the moment that we start producing that table. Mm. Yes. Yeah, 
like to, to hear maybe a little bit more about this correspondence between the space uh, of the Albert Kirk and the work of Giger, because I, I think actually we're talking about like two different concepts, because the church represents for me not the concept of history, whereas actually Giger's work tries to connect more to prehistory, which is of course an extended mm -hmm. part of history uh, to our understanding. But the church, which is also like an inst institution that has also like a, you know, a built form, an architectural form, stands also a bit in a contradiction to the pagan rituals. Of course, we all know that churches and religions are based on or have pagan roots, etc. So it's an evolving concept. But still, I see it as two different things. Like, and if I see the, the church where people especially artists might be tempted to work in, in a way that is also connected to a certain kind of spiritualism, and if it's not spiritual, maybe a sort of an existentialism. Mm -hmm. And this uh, open space that has no constraints, like, you know, you mentioned these constraints, because how the people move, etc., it's very free, you know, and also in this very beautifully shot film, you have this, uh, I mean, you have a route or a sort of Navigation, but it's still you know, the yes. relation between the, the open space, the landscape, and the protagonist is very um, suspenseful or very yeah. interesting. The only protagonist is the crossing itself, mm -hmm. to cross something, yes. But even there, you don't follow a very no. strict chron chronology, it's very open also to the public or yes. to the viewers to decide yes. on where is this kind of open yes. journey coming. Mm -hmm. So in the sense of history versus prehistory, I think in the video it's very interesting that you actually relate to things that are not yet defined, mm -hmm. because from an anthropological point of view, things that happened before the was migrate, mm -hmm. know, migratory yes. migration movements that happened, I don't know, in Southeast Asia, in Sardinia, which is also this megalithic culture, yes. or Ireland, Nowadays, yes. Ireland are very Mind similar the because they come out of the body, the, yes. you know, your radius of a human being. Also, um, it's a period that we use these rituals to understand something, to create knowledge. Yeah. They try to, because they are afraid of everything, they try to create and understand something. Of course, advanced religions tend to make you forget what you know also. That's why the problem <laughs> is uh, it's much more constrained, let's say, in, in that way. Um. But it, it's not so much literary history indeed, it's, it's indeed this experience that you, um, that is important and where the knowledge production comes in. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, because it doesn't have a as you said in prehistory, especially when we don't have writing material, linearity is, is given by the written word, no? It's not a... Because if we go with um, scientific exploration and so on, the span is very wide. You cannot say... You can find causality, of course. Yeah. But it's not so uh, defined as, the, as a written record or something like this. So it's much more open, as you say, it's not a structure. But maybe isn't that pushing when that like um, openness is so a search for something linear? Or could you see it like that? Yeah, we understand in a linear, linear way. The, the only way that our brain works is wired like that. Mm. But actually, reality is not linear. But we understand all of that uh, frame. But when you are <coughs> making your work like these benches, or when you are doing this, like this mm. very, um, uh, also this physical, the whole time stepping in that salt, mm. It feels also like you are, uh, yeah, why this search or why 
Well, as I said, biographically, I'm not very keen to, and I'm not very um, connected to my geographical location, let's say. That's why it's, it's an easy route for me to blend geography, culture, timelines, uh, because I don't feel uh, a personal connection to anything. That's why everything is easier for me to, uh, to understand. And that, like textures or sens sensations and landscapes, work better for me to, to get a location. So I prefer to, when you come into spaces that I curated more, let's say, not only with the video, but with a few pieces, to, to know that you're located in a certain area in the world, you can understand that, you can feel it, but you don't know when, and you don't know exactly where, and, uh, and you don't know exactly also what's happening there. But you have a feeling of that you are there, it's okay. So this is what I'm, because this is how I feel personally also. Mm -hmm. yeah. It was interesting because it re also the first time I saw the film, mm -hmm. I had to think about uh, the Medea film by Pier Paolo Pasolini. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if you look at Pasolini's film work, and, he, and specifically the films he did about, or with antique motifs, like yeah. Medea and Ridicos and the Oresti, yeah. He also always chose places that are not actually authentic. Mm -hmm. so, the, or even the Matthew this uh, the Angela, mm -hmm. he did he, he tried to shoot it in Palestine, mm -hmm. I call it, but then he should have shot it in Turkey. Pretty close he shot in Morocco, Medea he shot in Cappadocia and Turkey, yes. and the RST he was planning to shoot in Africa. Mm -hmm. So in a way this switch between authentic places uh, yes. is quite interesting. But you went back to a place, though it's 400 years ago, that is connected by your <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I changed also the geography of the, of the video <laughs> in, in this. Uh, so, yes, it works. Uh, I think it, it works much better like uh, in that way, because you can distill yeah, yeah, what it's you're it's looking it's for. Because if you go back to that, there are a lot of elements coming back from that, from that what you're trying to recreate. But if you go to, it's like an empty canvas, you know. You spare the stuff. You can, mm -hmm. you do only this, so it's easier to control like that. Was it just a lawsuit? 
it was just a loss of you don't it, it doesn't work if you go for the compromise so you have to and but how can I keep the conversation going Yeah, that was the diff because it um, it was already there, so that's when the conversation uh, came, the lawsuit came up, and the window was already there, so we couldn't go back anymore. Um, so that's where the conversation came in, and we tried to include them. We included them in the process already, but then in the end we said, yeah, but this is are only a few voices that we hear now, and there are many more, so we decided to do proceed. Because we, you know, that's how it happened then, because you cannot start when we're trying to find agreement, because that's that's so difficult, in this case, huh? that, that was. Yeah, but I think many voices, they're just not working in the church, and those little voices, they're like every day in the church, and they see this light every day, it's a bit different. Yeah, but since then we we uh, we changed the way of working. We included them before, so it's also a learning curve for us also how to do and how to move forward doing that and um, yeah. learning from all sides. Right. So that that's that's what I sense indeed. And now it's more common uh, to have these big installations in the church. So. Now it's more easy also to have the conversation. Thank you. Thank you.